Good evening, Bible Baptist. Great to see you tonight. Let's all stand if you would. Join us as we sing. Your love is amazing. telling you that's what it is all right thank you you may be seated hey we've got just a couple of announcements don't forget who's coming august 22nd thank you all right all right everybody is required to bring 22 people that's all you got to do all right no invite somebody bring somebody i think we still have one or two posters out front if you'd like to get one i have been going around town i've actually noticed them in stores thank you for getting them out there and that is that is a blessing and uh, also we have our deacon groups coming up uh that'll be coming up also the 22nd and then you know who's in the house besides jesus samuel and all right tonight right after service we'd like to invite you back to a little reception and some uh, 
vittles here that we have in Oklahoma. Amen. Uh, but no, we're going to have a great time of fellowship, and we like to invite everybody back for that. So let's have the ushers come down at this time, and we will receive our evening offering. Father, we just praise your name. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful services that we've had uh, this morning, and we look forward to, hear, forward to hearing your word tonight. Lord, we'd ask that you just meet with us, and Lord, we'd just ask you to receive this offering. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. <laughs> This time, Samuel and Julia are going to come sing before Brother Steve. road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's no other way to tell you than to say. change them if I could for through it all God's been good times replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. You see, I've had more gains than losses, and I've no more joy than hurt. As his grace rolled down upon me, undeserved, God's been good in my And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my tell you everything he is. 
go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. Samuel went to a conference in Tennessee, and this old preacher got up and he said, Somebody hold my mule while I shout glory. And that tickled him so pink, he got on the phone to me and told me that, and that's just about how I feel. Someone hold my mule. I don't even have a mule, but somebody hold my duck. Somebody hold my sea -doo. I don't know. If you haven't got your reading plan for August, I would ask you, could you raise your hand if you want a copy of the reading plan for August? Samuel has some of these if you don't have one. Uh, it's really important that we stay under the influence of the Word of God. And I just want to keep on encouraging you to read your Bible with the church. You can do your own Bible reading, I know it. But there's something special when we're together reading together. Because tonight I'm going to introduce you to 1 Corinthians. And we're going to be reading 1 Corinthians in the month of August. And then when we get halfway through the month, we're going to start reading 2 Corinthians, and I'll do the intro on that book as we get there. But tonight, if you didn't watch your video, you're going to get from the message these points. There was five problems in the Corinthians church. You can put them in your notes on that card. So important. Um, before I start preaching, is Paul in the house? Paul Countess, where are you? Paul, could you come up here for a minute? Can you make sure this mic is hot, please? I just want Paul to give a quick report on camp before I get started. And the stats are here if you've forgotten anything. I have, but <laughs> yes. Thank you. First of all, yes, camp was an incredible time seeing God do what only he can do with the lives of children. I didn't know I'd be giving this report. I'm already getting emotional thinking yeah. about the lives that have been changed. Two children committed themselves to missions. They're not exactly sure how God wants them to get involved in missions. But there are two young ladies that are saying, God, whatever you want for me, I'm ready to serve in missions. Praise God. Uh, five rededications. Children that knew Jesus, but they knew they hadn't been living right. Praise God. They came to the realization, several of them going home, talking to their parents, saying, Mom, Dad, I need to have a renewed commitment to Christ. I don't know what could warm your heart more other than those kids that did come home saying, God, I, God, you've given me the greatest gift, the forgiveness of my sins, the Holy Spirit that gets to walk with me, and I know that you are preparing a place for me. Children truly had a life-changing experience, and it wasn't just the fun. It wasn't just the heat and the humidity. It, it was literally God's presence just being poured out on the kids. We had mission stopped. We learned how what God is doing in Lot in Oklahoma, what he is doing in New York City, and what he is doing abroad, other places. The kids got to see with their own eyes what this looks like to when we partner with God in his ministry. And so for those of you who had children that went, thank you for sending them. I hope they came back really tired. <laughs> I'm still recovering. But more than that, I hope they came back with a renewed passion for their Savior, Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that this would be contagious for all of us when we consider what God can do in the lives of children. Just two weeks ago, we got to see children leading us in worship. Oh, they are worthy of our investment. So for those of you who went as counselors, thank you. I pray that it was a life-changing week for you. For those of you that prayed for us as we were there, thank you. Your prayers were heard. And for those of you that financially supported us, 
thank you. We gave so many scholarships to kids that could not have made it. Thank you. Thank you, church, for believing in what God can do in the lives of children between ages of four, 4 to 14. Thank you. And I pray that you would also consider, consider on the 25th of this month, we are starting our Wednesday night kids club. Sign up as you leave the exits because we have a great job, a great task ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I didn't get up here tonight to tell you how important it is to send kids to camp. I came here to tell you, oh, you didn't know? You didn't know it's important to send kids to camp? Because you knew it was important to send kids to camp, right? I just, just something got stuck in my head from this morning's message. Now, how many of you have heard this saying, and I'll say it and see if you can finish it. Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for life. You've got to know that that's my plan with getting you reading the Word of God. I can get up and give you a message. Or I can teach you how to get a message every single day from God. And If I can teach you how to eat the bread of life every single day, you'll be ten times the Christian than if you just come to church and listen to me preach. Because if you just come and listen to me preach, I fed you for a day. And then when you don't get to the church, you don't get fed. But I'll tell you what, the whole reason we're doing these studies and trying to get you to read through the book is I know it's more powerful to teach every member to read their Bible and have a relationship with God on a daily basis. Study the Word of God and you'll find out worship was never reserved for Sunday. Saturday in the Bible was the day of rest. Sabbath is the day of rest. It was never called the day of worship. God expected us to worship Him every day. So if we don't worship Him every day, we're failing because He's an everyday God. How many of you only need God on Sunday? Raise your hand. All right, how many of y'all need Him every day? All right, how many of y'all should worship Him every day? Yeah, now you're getting it. Yes, Sunday is the day we get together as a corporate body. It's very special. That doesn't mean we don't worship the rest of the week. And I hope that's what you're getting from the Bible studies that we've been doing, trying to get the whole church reading through the Bible. I don't know about you this morning. I was learning something here in church as the pastor was preaching, as Samuel was giving the word. Um, you all know there's 66 books in the Bible, right? I just never dawned on me there were 66 books in Isaiah, and I didn't know that division uh, of Isaiah. I'm going to have to go and look at that because I was like, hmm, Papa's getting a lesson, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's good when Papa can get a lesson because it's exciting. Now, I pray tonight you'll be fed of the Lord as we go into our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul was led of the Lord to take the gospel into key cities during the time that he was alive. And this is so important for you to realize. Where is Corinth? And as I put up this scene, and there's an arrow up there telling you to take notice of this outcropping of stone. That's not just a mountain or a hill. It has a special name. But who can tell me, where is Corinth? Where would you find it today in the world? It's in Greece. So if we turn to the next slide and you can see the location, you have Greece, you have Athens, and it's just there beside. And so if you know anything about Greece, as a child growing up, I used to watch TV programs about what kind of gods. The Greek gods, right? I mean, you grew up knowing about these gods, and Greece is noted for being a place of idol worship. So as you're thinking about Corinth, no, Paul went to a city that was very important in the worship of idols, and we're going to look at that. But what I want you to see is the special trade route going to Corinth. So as we back up and look more at a world map, you'll see that people coming from Jerusalem to Rome would go through Corinth. People coming from Egypt to Rome would pass through Corinth. And there was a reason. Anyone coming from Asia would go through Corinth. Those coming down from Macedonia would go through Corinth. 
And you say, why? It was very dangerous to take that red and yellow root around. During that time, it was said, if you made it once, don't try it a second time. It was so dangerous. It's a 200-mile loop around. It was safer to go into Corinth, and I'm going to show you why it was so important to go through Corinth instead of to go around. But I want you to know that Paul visited Corinth on his second missionary journey with Silas. And if we're going to take time in a few minutes to read from Acts chapter 18 when he was on this journey and he stayed here in Corinth. And that would have been in the dates 49 to 52 A.D. But on the next slide you're going to see they would carry their cargo across this four-mile isthmus, which is a land bridge. And it was safer for them to boat in, carry their load across the four miles, pick up their boat, carry their boat across, and then put it back in the water. It was much safer to do this. I didn't say easier, safer, and then go around. Or they would have a ship meet them there, and they would just unload the cargo, move the cargo across, and get it on another ship. So can you imagine all the travel from all those places going through Corinth? The city was a bustling community, a melting pot of people, a very important location for the gospel. Where is 1 Corinthians in the Bible? Let's look at it. When you see the Old Testament on the left, the New Testament on the right, it is the seventh book of the New Testament. It's coming after the Gospels, after Acts in Romans, and that's his positioning in the Bible placed very early. And I want to ask you, how many know the patron god of Corinth? Who was the god, the father of all the gods that was worshipped in Corinth? His name was Poseidon. Poseidon. And this city was given over to the worship of Poseidon, but idol worshipers don't have to worship just one god. And we're going to look in a moment at some of the other gods that they worshipped. But for me as a kid growing up, I mean, I like Poseidon. And I'm, I'm not an idol worshiper, I just like the stuff about Poseidon because I love the water. It, P Poseidon never had a sea dew, that's the only thing he didn't do. But he rode dolphins and things like that. But Poseidon is the god of the sea, and then... He has his brother Zeus, who is the god of the sky, and you know Hades, he is his brother, he is the god of the underworld. So you have Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades are the main three patron gods of the Greek people. I want you to get that in your mind, because sometimes you watch that stuff on TV, and you wonder, where did that come from? Now, these gods were worshipped by people in the day and age. And today we kind of think of them as myth and legends. These, these people actually worshipped these gods. But let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 18. And let's learn about Paul's journey into Corinth. Acts chapter 18 verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came unto them and he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Paul didn't have a pocket full of money to survive on. When he got to Corinth, what did he have to do? He had to get a job and get to work. He met some fellow Jews that were also tent makers. And you say, what is a tent maker? They were very skilled at taking animal skin and sewing them into tents so that people could stay out of the weather. That was his job. Verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the what? Yes, these Greeks were there. So some of these Greeks were going to the synagogue. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in, in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. This is important. He was there in the synagogue. He was not necessarily teaching all the time. He would sit. The scrolls were read. The scrolls were read. But one day he couldn't contain himself. He jumped up and what did he do? 
Man, he said, you guys got to know this Jesus that was crucified in Jerusalem, buried and rose again. He is the promised Messiah. Verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go to who? Oh, wow. He was trying to preach the gospel, and it says they opposed themselves. Listen, the word of God proves that Jesus is the Messiah. So if you throw away the word of God and reject Jesus Christ, you oppose yourself. Because he clearly taught Jesus is the Messiah, and he used the Old Testament to do it. At this time, he didn't have the New Testament. He didn't get up and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Didn't have it yet. He was used in the Old Testament scripture to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He did everything that he was supposed to do. And they opposed him, and they blasphemed. So he says, okay, your blood is upon your own heads, because I've done what I've needed to do. Seven. And he departed thence, and he entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one of the worshiper, one that worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. Now, Paul didn't go far, did he? Kick him out of the synagogue, and he just goes next door. Right next door, there's a man named Justice. He believes, and he starts a house church in Justice's house. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And listen to this. And many. How many? Many of the Corinthians hearing. Believed. And were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul. In the night. By a vision. Be. Not. Afraid. But speak. And hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have what? Much people in this city. Hallelujah. Do you know when I came to Chickasha, my biggest fear is God doesn't have people in this city. Right? Because I want to live in a city that has what? God says, I got a lot of people in this city I want to save. And what's been exciting since coming to Chickasha, we've seen a lot of people get saved, right? And we've got to beg God. God, put people in our city. If they're not here, move them here because we want to get them saved, right? And, and that was his command. God said, don't leave. I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Hey, folks, that's the intro to 1 Corinthians. That's how the church started. That's the backstory to this book. I hope it's exciting to you because he came into this idol-worshiping community and he went to the synagogue and he preached and people started to get saved. How many? Many. Now watch this. We want to look at this timeline whenever we're studying the Bible. So Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, the timeline is this. He went there on the second missionary journey. That's the 49 to 52 A.D. Then he returned and visited them again on his third missionary journey for a shorter time. Then he left and he went to Ephesus. And when he went to Ephesus, he heard bad news was in Corinth. And there from Ephesus, he wrote a letter and sent it back. And if you remember where Corinth is, you just go across the ocean to the other side, to Asia. There's Ephesus. There he was in the church at Ephesus and sent this letter back. That gives you the date and setting. When you look at that date, 56 A.D., how many years since Jesus has died, buried, and rose again? He's only been gone for 26 years, right? 26 years after Jesus Christ. This is important for us to understand the time frame. That's why you need to understand they did not have the New Testament in their hands yet. It was not completed. Now let's look at an intro to the book of 1 Corinthians. I want to tell you that history shows us that the average population of Corinth at this time is 700,000 people. Do you know in antiquity that is a huge city? That is a large city. How big is Chickasha? We're a little peanut, folks. This city was a monster. There was a lot going on in this city. The city of Corinth was filled with temples and shrines uh, to their many gods. But the most prominent temple in Corinth was built 
for the worship of Epaphrodite. How many of you have heard of her, Epaphrodite? All right. On the top of a 1,800-foot-tall hill called the Acro Corinth, or the Upper Corinth. That's the stone I pointed out to you in that picture. In this temple, this temple was dedicated to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in this temple, dedicated worshipers had free use of the 1,000 consecrated prostitutes that served there. The city of Corinth thrived on commerce, entertainment, immorality, and dishonesty. Pleasure seekers would flood into Corinth for a holiday from what? Morality. The term Corinthiamazo meant to act like a Corinthian. So if someone called you that, it literally meant you were behaving like an immoral person. Don't ever name your child Corinthian, okay? It is not a compliment. It's just like calling them Judas. You don't want to do it, all right? It's not a lovely name. So with this background, know that Paul arrives in a city that is like a Las Vegas, all right? Do you know a city in America that's called Sin City? All right, well, this is the type of city that he arrived at with the gospel, and God says, listen, I want you to be brave, don't be afraid, stand your ground, preach the word, because I have a lot of people I'm going to save here. Now, you know, when I think about one of the most sinful cities in the world, I don't think, you know what, we men, we got to get there because those people are ripe for the picking. They're ready to get saved. But God told Paul what? Go to Corinth, stay at Corinth, because I'm going to do a great work at Corinth. We kind of look at immorality, we look at sin, and we say, Satan's got this buttoned up. He's already won. No, he's not. Not when God's in the fight. And so I want you to look at this beautiful opening. This is the purpose verse of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. This is our purpose verse when we read. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are what? That means set apart. Set apart. You, you were once worshiping idols, but now you're what? Set apart to Jesus Christ. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be what? Do you know what the word saints is? Holy ones. Anytime you hear the word saints, it's holy ones. A lot of you that went to Roman Catholic Church, you think saints are people that have achieved a certain position in the church. Do you know the moment you receive Jesus Christ, you're a saint? Yes, because your sin has been taken away and you have become a holy one. So Paul is writing to the believers and he says, listen folks, you've been set apart and you are called to be holy unto your God, not immoral. And, and this is the theme of the book. With all that in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. We've got to get this in our mind. Those that are set apart to God are called to do what? Live holy lives that please God. This is the message he's sending back to the church because he heard things were not going well in Corinth, and that's why he's writing. Well, 1 Corinthians is a letter to correct a wayward church. When you're reading in 1 Corinthians, you know you're reading a book to correct a what? A wayward church. So folks, as we read 1 Corinthians, we better read carefully. Because if we have anything wayward in us, it's going to come out in the book. Because that's what it's for. If Corinthians steps on our toes, we better be careful. The theme of 1 Corinthians is bringing the gospel of Jesus into the life of the believer. Some of you are very careful. You like to keep your Bible on the coffee table. You don't like to keep it in your heart. You know why? Because if you put it in your heart, you won't sin against God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, if it's on the coffee table, it's not going to change your life. But you let this book get in your heart, and that's what Paul is going to teach all through this letter, he's going to bring the gospel of Jesus into the life of the believer. And he says, listen, Christ changes us. Christ changes us. 
So as we look at this letter, Paul will address five major problems. The cross of Christ must transform what? Yes. And if you think you can get saved and not change, you haven't met Jesus. Because that's what Jesus does. He will send Paul into Corinth, not so that Paul will become like the Corinthians, but he wants the Corinthians to become like Paul. And we don't need to go out in the world to be like the world, to reach the world. We need to go out, out in the world and be like Christ to win people to Christ. Do you know if I go out in the world looking like the devil trying to lead people to Christ, they'll never follow me because I'm no different than them. You've got to put on a different armor if you're going to win people to Jesus. And so this is the greatest teaching of this book. The cross of Christ must transform our lives. Well, let's look at the breakdown of the book. We're going to look at these five problems. So if you have your notes and you have problem number one, you're on track here. Problem number one. The first thing that Paul's going to address is this nasty word. What is it? Divisions. And, and Jesus Christ is our reason for unity. We have one Savior. All right, folks. If you have one Savior, we better be unified. Because you don't have one Savior and I don't have an, another Savior. The same God who saves an Oki saves a Yankee. Right? Hey, we have to be unified. You don't have a different Savior than me. I don't know if Jesus wore cowboy boots, but it would be smart to wear them when you're walking through the they gave with those snakes around, right? We've got to know he's our unifier, isn't he? Not politics, not place you're born. We're unified because we love Jesus, and that unifies us. And I want us to read this key verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul addresses the divisions in the church. And anytime you see this word beseech in the, in the King James, it's literally, I beg you, okay? He says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. That means be in harmony. Speak the same thing. Be in harmony. And that there be no what? That there be no divisions among you. Paul had heard there were some divisions, and he's going to teach about these divisions. And he's going to take four chapters to talk about these divisions. But he says, see that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Think alike. Let the word of God impact your minds. You have to think alike. And the same judgment. You need to have the same purpose. Do you know if... If I have one purpose and you have another purpose and you have another purpose, we're all going in different directions. And you know what the purpose of the church is? Bring people to Jesus and build up the church to serve. Yes, we serve Jesus Christ. And so we need to make sure that our purpose is united. When we all have a different purpose for coming to church, church, church becomes divided. And here's the great teaching of this first division, first four chapters there should be no divisions among you. If you're a member of Bible Baptist Church and you've noted a division, the first thing you should do is try to bring unity. Do you see, every one of our deacons is supposed to bring unity to our church. If they hear a problem, see a problem, smell a problem, they're told a problem, their goal is to bring back the unity of our church. If you wonder what is the job of a deacon, a job of a deacon is to help the pastor care for the flock. Because it's natural for the flock to divide. It's supernatural to keep the flock united. So deacons are supposed to be men that have supernatural power to serve a supernatural God. Because you know what? As the church gets bigger and bigger, the pastor can't do it all. And there's a certain amount of help he needs from these deacons. And Paul is going to tell you, listen, the thing that kills the church is division. And once we say it's okay to be divided, our church will eventually lose its power. Are you with me? All right, let's go to number two. Some of you aren't going to like this, but he dedicates chapters 5, 6, and 7 to what nasty word? Sex. Sex is not a bad word. It's not a bad word. God has given us sex, but he's going to address sexual immorality when sex is not being handled the way God wants it to be handled. And so we're going to have to look at what he says in verses 5, 6, and 7. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he lets us know how terrible things were in Corinth. He says, it is reported commonly 
that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So a man was sleeping with his stepmom in the church, and nobody was doing anything, no one was saying anything. Hey, this is okay, we have freedom in Christ. Paul wrote and said, no, this will not fly in the house of God. God has given us some rules for sex, and the church needs to know what those rules are, and we need to support them. There's a reason for integrity. Immorality destroys the church. And if we want to play with immorality, you will destroy the church. So Paul is in Ephesus hearing about the immorality, and he's going to write about it. So when you're reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6, and 7, you're going to see Paul is going to get on this hobby horse right here. And we need to be sensitive because America is going off track. Going off track. So as we read these verses, guess what we're going to say? We need to hear that here. We need to hear that here. That's the second part. Now the third part is kind of strange. The third division is chapters 8 through 10. And this is about food. And some of you are thinking, food? Come on. Well, remember, there was Jews and Gentiles, the Jews had their dietary laws, but then the Gentiles were worshiping all of these idols. And most of the meat killed was sacrificed to idols, and then the meat was sold in the markets. And so if you were to go to the market to buy meat that was offered to an idol, somebody thinks you're worshiping that idol. So Paul is going to do some teaching on what food we should eat and what food we shouldn't eat. And there's going to be a law that determines what we do and what we don't do. And it's going to be very interesting as we read the food rules. Now, one of the major verses on the food rule is this, 1 Corinthians 8.13. Wherefore, if meat make thy brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. You say, that is a hard verse. And if you will read what Paul said about food, if because I'm eating this meat, it causes this brother to fall away, I'll stop eating that meat. My love for people should control what I eat, not what I like. I should be love-driven, not belly-driven. Okay? Why? I feel like I can eat that. Nothing in the Word of God says I shouldn't. But if it's causing your brother to stumble, why don't you love your brother and stop eating that? Do you know in Africa, if we wanted to have a ministry to Muslim people, do you think you can invite a Muslim to your house and offer him pig? I don't have any problem with eating pork. I ate pork today. But if not if I'm having a Muslim over. Because I'm not going to offend him when I'm trying to build a relationship with him. And there's things that you don't do to hurt a relationship. And Paul says, we, our tongue should be governed by love, not lust. I just don't do whatever I want. And the food rules are very interesting in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Because the core principle is I must be controlled by love, not appetite. And there's a lot of applications to this, but we'll let you learn more about that in your reading. Don't let your belly guide your life. Let your heart or your love control your life. Because this was about meat offered to idols. The fourth division of the book of Corinth is called the gathering. The gathering. And that's in verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Very interesting that the love chapter of the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The love chapter, 13. The communion passage where we learn about communion is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Very interesting, all about the gathering. When you gather for communion, when you gather, it ought to be for love. And so there's some sweet teaching about the gathering of the church. Why do we as a church meet? Some people say, I go to church and I don't get anything. You've really missed it. You, you come to church to give something. You come to church to give God worship because he's worthy. We're such selfish people, we don't understand that. I came to church to get something. I want to get something from the message. It's good to get something from the message. But you get a lot more when you give more. You know, if you don't have skin in the game, you don't get much. But I've learned that if I'm going to drink, i got to put my cup under the faucet. I can't put my cup in the middle of the room and think that the water's going to jump in there. i got to get it under the faucet, right? 
And I tell you, when you get to church, you've got to get your cup under the faucet. You've got to say, I'm here to worship. I want to hear from God. I love his word, and I want to get closer to him. The gathering, we're going to learn the core purpose of why we meet together. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 14, 12, as he introduces one of the most important reasons we go to church. He said, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to what? Edify of the church. Listen, when we come, we're, we're looking to build up the church. Build up the church. That means we're going to have to put some skin in the game. If you want to come to church and build up the church, you're going to have to work. Not just come to get something. Well, I want to come to the church where the music is just what I like. Yeah, that's the selfish church. We've got to come to church to say, I want to come to church to serve God. I want to lead someone else, help someone else, be a blessing. Now you're building. Right? Building. Investing. Where are we going? How can I give? How can I be a part? Where can I serve? It's always amazing when someone goes to a church and they say, this church is a loving church. Well, how many people did you shake their hands and smile? Well, nobody. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you complain that I haven't called you in a long time, I ask you, when's the last time you called me? Isn't that kind of sneaky? Yeah, because if you're complaining someone hasn't called you, you've got to turn around and judge yourself. Because that's the way we must do it. But when I come to church, I've got to come to tell God I love him. And I want to put my heart in the game. I want to love you and serve you and make much of you. So what's the purpose of our gathering? It's not for us to get puffed up. It's not for us to get messed up. It's not for us to get stirred up into trouble. It's for us to get built up in our faith. So we're coming here so we understand the word of God better. If you go home knowing more about the word of God than when you came, guess what? You're blessed. And you're being built up in your most holy faith because that's what you're going to learn. That's what you're going to use to live a successful Christian life. So the purpose of the gathering is not just to have fun or be comfortable. It is so that you know how to fight against the devil. So the core purpose of gathering is for the edification of the body of Christ. Now, let number five, the fifth section of this book. This is the hallmark book, the hallmark chapter on the resurrection. If you ever want to know more about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58 verses of honey about the resurrection. Because someone went to Corinth and told them there's no such thing as a resurrection. And Paul says, i got to straighten out this problem. And when his pen started going, it didn't shut off for a while. So when you're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is all about the resurrection. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, our faith is what? Vain, empty, worthless. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 13, and 14. He writes, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Listen, if Christ didn't rise, the whole church in Corinth, there's no need for it. Go back to your gods. But Jesus Christ is risen. So then he says, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? I'm telling you, there's not a more powerful passage of scripture about the resurrection than 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the greatest miracle of Jesus. It is his greatest victory. He defeated, defeated sin, death, in the grave for you and me. So I hope you're getting excited about reading 1 Corinthians. Amen? I hope you're getting excited. Then he ends the book with a final greeting. That's chapter 16, the final greeting. And one of the most amazing verses lays in this final greeting. It's a charge to the church. As he wraps up his letter, listen how he ends it. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. This is power packed. In our men's fellowship, we studied this a couple years ago. Didn't we, Dave? This was our key verse, and we went at it month after month after month. And literally, where it says, quit you like men, some of you are thinking men like to quit. No, this is not quit like and quit. It's act like. Act like a man. Act like a godly man. So many men are not acting like godly men. And Paul ends his letter 
final greeting to the church says, hey men, you need to stop acting like the world. You got to stop acting like you're wild. You have to stop acting like an idol worshiper. You've got to act like a man of God. You need to stand fast in the faith and quit you. Like stand ready to fight, act like a man, and then be strong, be courageous. Those are his final words. And that's how the book of 1 Corinthians is going to come to a close. So there he is in Ephesus, brokenhearted to hear about all these problems. And he writes this letter, 1 Corinthians, to get a wayward church back online. So that is the total picture. This is what you're looking for as you're going through 1 Corinthians. Now I want to close with this. This is what I want you to learn. Jesus, is this statement true or false? Jesus changes everything he touches. Right? Jesus, if he touches something, it doesn't stay the same. When he touches a leper, what happens to a leper? They're cleansed, right? What does he do if a lady's hunched over and he touches her? Yeah. What, what happens if, if you're lame and Jesus touches you? What happens if you're blind and Jesus touches you? Yeah. So now here it is. Yes or no, has Jesus touched your life? If you say yes, then your life better be changed. Because that's what this book is about. There's no way you can tell me Jesus has touched you and, and, you're, and you're still the same. I love that song, he touched me. He touched me. And now I'm washed. I'm whole. I'm not the same as I used to be. I have a different taste. I have a different view. I hear different. I, I see different. I walk different. I have a different purpose in life. So I want to ask you, then how has your life changed since coming to know Jesus? How has your life changed? You see, it's really easy to say yes, but then when you're asked the how, you need to be very specific. How has your life changed since you've come to know Jesus Christ? I end with this thought and we pray. A salvation that cannot be tested should not be trusted. You see, if you just say, I believe in Jesus and there's nothing going on in your life, He's, you're not in love with him. You don't want to pursue him. You don't want to read his word. You're too busy to take time to read his word and know him. Then something's wrong. Because if you don't want your salvation tested, I don't think it should be trusted. When God was there in heaven and Satan came into his presence, he said to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Satan says, yeah, I've seen him. But if you touch him, he'll curse you. God said, yeah, go ahead and touch him. Take everything. And he says, yeah. Did Job pass the test? Yes, because he not only had a faith that could be boasted about, he had a faith that could be tested, right? And he passed the test. And you and I, if we're going to say, I love Jesus Christ, he's my savior. Then you know what we should be able to say? I know that my faith is going to be tested so that it can be trusted. Life is going to test our faith. COVID can test our faith. The death of a loved one can test our faith. Trials can test our faith. But I tell you what, my prayer is, Lord, if my faith is tested, may it come forth as gold. I want to be genuine, and that's what the book of 1 Corinthians is about, and I hope you're excited that we're going to open this book and read through it this week, and I tell you week after week, if you are reading and you don't understand something, text me, and let's talk about it, because I don't want you to read the Bible and say, I don't understand it, I don't get anything out of it. The whole purpose of doing all of this teaching is so that when you read the Word of God, you get it. I want you to think about that um, upper Corinth. All the way up there, they were building shrines and temples to their gods. And they would climb up there to go to that Epaphrodite's temple where those prostitutes were. And faithful worshipers were free to go up there and pleasure themselves in these palaces of immorality. And the believers in Corinth had to break from that life and be totally different. And that's why he ends and says to the men of Corinth, to the church of Corinth, Listen, you need to act like godly men and you need to be courageous because the people of Corinth are going to want to mold you into their image. You must resist that 
because you are a man of God, you're a woman of God, and you must honor your God. Would you stand with me tonight as we pray? Heavenly Father, your word is so beautiful, it's so powerful, it's so amazing. And somehow Satan confuses even believers to neglect your word. Praying that you would give us a passion as a church family to be reading your word together, growing closer to you as we read and understand your word. Lord, I don't know the trials that each one of our members have in their lives. But if tonight someone's going through a trial and they know this book is going to help them, they could come to the altar and ask you, give me wisdom and understanding as I read 1 Corinthians this month, that I might surrender and submit to the word of God and be obedient to what it tells me to do. That I would not satisfy my flesh and despise the teachings of my God. This is our prayer. Jesus, the only one who could ever see, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my close with a word of prayer asking God's blessing on our food and our fellowship in the back. Tonight is kind of a reception service for Samuel and Julia. Many of you couldn't make it up to Savannah, so we just wanted to introduce Julia to you all and give you an opportunity to fellowship and encourage them as they desire to please the Lord in their life. Samuel couldn't come home for the summer because he was working for UPS trying to get health insurance because he's now adulting. If He's going to be a husband. He has to take good care of his wife. And he was sharing with the Sunday school class that when he asked Mr. Cooper for Julia's hand, the answer wasn't just yes right away. And he was kind of expecting that. Uh, he got told, I want to know your plan. And, and Daddy wanted to know his plan to take care of his daughter. Like, are you going to have a job that has health insurance? I'm not turning my daughter over to a bum that's not going to take care of her because I take care of her. And uh, Samuel had to get his game up here. And so in presenting his plan to Mr. Cooper, he said, I have to stay in Tennessee, get in my time at UPS to get health insurance so that when we get married, I can take care of your daughter, my wife, I hope. And uh, he bought into the plan, so now he's got Julia, right? And so if you wonder why didn't he come home from college, it's, it's Mr. Cooper's fault. Now, I, I think it was love. I, I don't want to blame Mr. Cooper. He was... He was definitely on track, wanting his daughter well taken care of. Amen? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for the food. Father, we rejoice so much when we see our children walk in truth. They want to live for you and honor you. And I pray tonight that our church will be a blessing to Samuel and Julia to encourage them in their walk with you as they go back to Crown College for another year for Samuel finish up his senior year. We pray that you would bless their marriage with strength and beauty and your perfect timing. Bless them with children. Bless them with joy. Lord, 
pray, Father, that they would grow closer to you and become a wonderful team. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name, we ask your blessing on our food.